Good afternoon. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed your coffee break for the second time. Now we are placed and honored by uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Sue Gardner and Mr. Uh, Eric Muller. Uh, Ms. Eric Muller is the beauty uh, uh, manager of the Wikimania Foundation and Ms. Sue Gardner is the executive manager of uh, director of the uh, Wikimania Foundation. They will about to deliver a lecture about Wikimania Foundation or Wikimania 2008 and 2009 for about 30 minutes and 15 minutes will be open for you for discussion. Ms. Sue. I'm going to try and make this really informal. Um, so I was going to ask Eric to join me, but he wants to stay behind the desk. So he can stay behind the desk. Um, we're going to, we have a little PowerPoint, which I actually have not entirely seen. Eric crafted it over the last couple of days. It's a merging of a couple of other PowerPoints that we've done for other groups. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to um, talk both to people who may not know Wikimedia and the Wikipedia project particularly may not know it very well because um, I assume that there are some people here who are fairly new um, and you know this would be their first Wikimania and uh, and also there are obviously people here who know the projects really really well probably better than I do so we're talking to two audiences so I'm going to ask you to bear with us a little bit while we do some things that for some people will be really basic and then we're going to do some things that s may lose some of you so I'd like to ask actually for a show of hands who here is an active participant in the projects in any way like are you are you a Wikimedian yeah Okay, and then who here is not? Who's entirely new and doesn't really know very much? Okay, so there's a couple of that too. So I'll try and, I'll try and calibrate it so that it does what it can to work for both groups. Um, and we also have a survey. So actually, Frank, yeah. <laughs> do you mind handing those out? Would you mind? Yeah. Please don't start filling them out now. It's just a little survey. Don't start filling them out now because we're gonna talk about some of the stuff in them, but if you wouldn't mind filling them out, take it. <laughs> and Eric, can you get the pencils? <laughs> and give people the Wikipedia pencils? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have stickers. <laughs> yeah, we're not that good. Thank you. Um, so the survey, the survey there, if you care to, you can read the back of the survey is an elaborate, oh look, there's Eric Zekta. <laughs> the back of the survey has an elaborate disclaimer about how it is not statistically valid. We're very aware of the fact that the people who come to Wikimania are a self-selected group. So you're not going to be representative of the views of the average Wikimedian and certainly not representative of the views of the general public. Um, but we're hoping that you can give us some qualitative information. So feel free to write a lot. Um, we are very happy to read it and we're going to use uh, the feedback that you give us to inform our thinking and further develop our thinking about our goals um, going forward over the next year or so. Okay. So with that, um, I'll start. I'll try to start using Eric's laptop. Audiovisual. God, it seems to be dying for some reason. Yeah, I didn't like Egypt. I have a copy on a USB stick if you have an alternative device that we could run it on because my laptop seems so to be having some problems. We need. Thank you for tech support. I think that's the second Wikimedia laptop that has died, completely died on this, um, on this uh, conference so far. So, okay, can I make this work? Yes, I can. So for those who came into the room um, before we had our, our hesitation to hand up the surveys, if you don't have a survey, if you don't have a pencil, Wave and Frank will come and find you or Carrie will come and find you. That's Frank there. That's Carrie there. They also have stickers if you want them, and we even, I think, have some books if you want those. We have some copies of the O'Reilly book. So um, what we're going to go through today, Eric and I, um, we're kind of winging it. I'm going to do the first part. He's going to do the second part. Typically, what we try and do when we do a presentation like this is we encourage you to ask questions because sometimes you think of something, there's something that's not clear to you. If you wait 20 minutes until we finish talking, you won't remember what it was. So please feel free to jump in. I think there are some microphones, but it's a fairly small room, so you can just shout out. And if you do, 
I or Eric will repeat your question before we answer it so that everyone knows what you answered. But please, seriously, feel free to, um, to jump in, ask questions, ask for clarification, whatever you want as we talk. And I'll do some check-ins with you too to see if you're, if you're following and, and getting it. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through a little bit of an introduction for those who are less familiar with the Wikimedia projects. That will be short. Then we're going to talk through uh, the year in review, what our goals are going forward, and what we see coming up on the horizon over the next couple of years. And there's time for discussion, as I said, throughout or at the end. So for those who are completely new, the Wikimedia Foundation, I'm the executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation. Eric is the deputy director. It is the nonprofit organization that runs Wikipedia and its sister projects. It's newly based in San Francisco and it's supported by grassroots chapters in I believe now 17 countries. It hired its first employee in 2005, so it's quite a young organization. Um, and before then, up until that point, uh, Wikipedia was entirely volunteer run. And of course, at this point, it's you know 95% the work of volunteers, 99% the work of volunteers, and then there's a very small paid staff that supports that work. What is that work? We have 10 million, more than 10 million articles in 250 plus languages. That includes more than a billion words of text in English alone. It's a top 10 website globally by any measure, whether you use Alexa, Comscore, the Nielsen Net Ratings, or any other measure. We're in the top 10 worldwide. That puts us ahead of you know, household names like Amazon, eBay, the BBC, the New York Times, CNN, and so forth. And of course, the projects are all free of charge. They're free of advertising, and they're freely editable by anybody. I don't know how well you can see this um, sort of informational graphic. That's something that was originally published in the New York Times. It's their graphic, and it shows Wikipedia, which is in the red. So the column on the left in the red, that is a representation visually of the number of words in Wikipedia. And then if you can see, Eric, can you point? Do you have a pointer? <laughs> Eric will go and point to the screen. So the Oxford Dictionary in the middle and Britannica on the right. So that's by word count or by article count. I can't remember which. But the idea is just to give a visual manifestation of the size of the Wikipedia project. It's enormous. Okay, I'm going to move on now to talk more specifically about the organization itself. So it's a nonprofit. It's a charity. I was hired last at the end of June last year. And this is the context of the organization when I came into it. It hadn't had an executive director since the previous January. It hadn't had legal counsel since the previous April. It had had a couple of resignations and a couple of resignations on, on the horizon when I came in. And it had quite a small staff. It was interesting because there were some significant skills gaps on the staff from the perspective of a standard charity. So an ordinary charity would have, for example, people who were responsible for fundraising. And the Wikimedia Foundation had no people whose job was primarily to do fundraising. That's highly unusual for a charity. It was an unusual organization and is an unusual organization in many ways. Most of those ways are good, but some of them weren't. Not having fundraising staff didn't really make sense for an organization that worked based on donations from the general public. That was where we got our revenue from. And we were located at that time in St. Petersburg in Florida. For anybody who knows the United States well, you know that St. Petersburg, Florida is primarily known as a vacation town. It's a seaside community. It has a really good Dali Museum, but it is in no way a hotbed of technology or of Web 2.0 or anything like that. It was really the wrong place for us to be. It was a historical accident that we were there. So that's where we were a year ago, this time last year. Um, when I came in, I'm going to skip a bit. When I came in, um, the first thing that I did was talk to the Board of Trustees and ask how they felt about moving the organization. And happily, everybody was in agreement. It was fairly straightforward. We all thought that there were other places we could be that made more sense for us. Um, so we ran a little process to figure out where to go to. And we moved to San Francisco. And I think that's been mentioned a couple times here today. And you've probably seen, here's a photograph of the office in San Francisco. On the right, that's Mike Godwin, our lawyer, <laughs> for anybody who knows Mike. Mike can't be at Wikimania this year, unfortunately, but most people know him. He's usually around. That's the office in the early days. It looks just a tiny little bit nicer today. Um, so we relocated to San Francisco. Those of the staff who wanted to come with us came, and some of them are here in this room and at this conference. And you know them. You know Carrie and Brian and folks. 
Um, but we, we expanded the staff a little bit and we replaced the people who couldn't come with us uh, to San Francisco. And so we ended up hiring 13 new people in the San Francisco office. And I want to talk just for a minute about what that hiring process was like, because it was really interesting for me and Eric as we set about doing that. Um, it, it, as we went through the hiring of the staff, we realized some things about the projects that I hadn't realized before. Eric probably had a better handle on them than I did. But it was quite interesting because the first thing we realized was Wikimedia really is clearly a truly international organization. So we weren't we did not want to be in a position where we were hiring English-speaking American people to represent and to work with a community of volunteers that was global. It wasn't a fit. It wouldn't have really worked for us. So what we ended up doing was hiring nine of our 13 people have lived or worked extensively outside the United States. Um, that includes Eric himself, who relocated to work for the staff from Berlin. And Frank is here at the back. Frank is relocating to San Francisco. What town are you from in Germany? Gotting. Gotting? Okay. So he's relocating. Um, and the majority of the people who we hired came from somewhere outside the US or had worked extensively outside the US. We also found that we wanted to have as much representation of different languages as was possible for us for all the obvious reasons. Um, and so we were lucky to be able to recruit in the United States um, people who had lots of languages additional to English. So we now have in the office, or working closely with us, German speakers, people who speak Spanish, Japanese, French, Filipino, Dutch, and Polish, which is great. We're never going to really, in a tiny staff, cover even a large proportion of the languages of the world. We're never going to communicate directly with all the volunteers around the world in their own languages. But um, we think it's important that we have some facility and some flexibility in terms of how we talk to people. Um, we have six new female staff and seven new male staff, and three of them are longtime community members, which is really important. Um, we try and open all the new roles that we have, all the new positions that we have. We advertise them publicly, and I'm always very interested if there are Wikimedian um, volunteers applying for the jobs for all the obvious reasons. They have familiarity with the projects, they understand our values, they know what we're trying to get done. And so we've been lucky enough to recruit three people to the staff of the foundation who are longtime volunteers. And the other thing that we've managed to do over the last year is to implement a whole bunch of new controls, new reporting, new policies, and new procedures. The foundation, like any young organization, it starts, it doesn't have a lot of controls, it doesn't have a lot of systems and a lot of process. That's completely standard. Um, but it's important over time that organizations do develop that bedrock of policy and procedures, particularly for a charity. You know, people give us their own money to do the work that we're doing, and so it's really important that we be accountable to them and that we maintain high standards and that we be able to show that we've done that. And so we've done a lot of work documenting and creating new process over the last year so that we're above reproach, so that if people ask us a question, we have good answers for them. Does anyone have any questions at this point? I'll show you the office again. Yes? Hi. Uh, um, I'm asking about the sustainability model here. You're, you just mentioned that base, uh, your organization based on donation till the moment. Is that correct? Donation? Uh, do you think it's about time to think uh, of uh, having a different business model, more sustainable model, taking this small organization into uh, a, a leverage stage that y you have a real institutional capacity to, to continue the great work you are doing for the last uh, four or five years? Uh, I think this is uh, an important aspect for uh, Wikimedia to, to consider rather than counting on uh, just a simple uh, uh, donation model. So the question was, um, should Wikimedia rely primarily on donations or should it be looking at other potential business models? And this is a question that we get asked regularly. Um, and our answer really is that at the end of the day, you have to figure out, you know, are you an apple, are you an orange? Like, what are you as an organization? What do you want to be in the world? And the small decisions that you make add up to big decisions about who you are and how you're positioning yourself. 
Um, we make a small amount of money through earned income, through business development, but it's a very small proportionately. I think about 98 or 99 percent of the revenue that we generate is through donations. And we're really proud of that. And the reason we're proud of it is because um, what it tells us is we're accountable to the people who donate money to us, and the more of them that there are, the better off we are, because what it says to us is that we're relevant and we're useful and that people care about us. It's similar to um, the public broadcasting model in parts of the world, the public broadcasting model certainly in the United States, where the people who use the service pay for the service, right? So the people who read Wikipedia like it and care about it and are interested enough that they are willing to fund it. And it's not a one-to-one -one ratio, so they're not covering their own costs. It is not the entire audience of readers who's paying for the service. It is a small subset of readers who are paying for the service to everyone. But I even like that better, right? Because what that means is, I like it so much, I'm not just gonna buy it for myself, I'm gonna buy it for 10 other people who can't afford to make a contribution themselves. Right? But we like being a charity, right? We consider ourselves a, a public-spirited institution that wants to make the world a better place, and I don't think that we would want to create a position for ourselves where we had other motivations or other incentives to behave in ways that would be commercially useful to us, but might detract us from our public service mandate. So we're happy with what we are, and it's interesting because it's fairly common for journalists to write stories about how, you know, people will write, the, the Los Angeles Times wrote a story with the headline, um, Wikipedia's tin cup approach wears thin, right? And people do occasionally write stories where the premise of the story is that we're having a hard time funding ourselves or we're struggling to stay afloat. And that actually isn't the case. It's interesting, I think my next slide is about finances. Um, but it isn't the case. What I have found in fundraising for this organization is that people love it, like particularly Wikipedia. The other projects have smaller and no less engaged audiences, but really there is a wide, huge number of people who just really feel an enormous amount of goodwill towards Wikipedia and they want to support it. And that's a nice place to be. So here's some financial information about the past year. We have an online fundraiser every winter, which again is similar to a public broadcasting model where you know, you're asking people for money for a campaign for a period of a couple of months. Last year we brought in 1.6 million. You may have seen another number which was 2.1 million. That included uh, an additional $500,000 donation, which here is broken out differently. But we brought in $1.6 million through the online fundraiser last winter, which was the biggest fundraiser that we had ever done. So that was good. In business development, we've made about $150,000 so far this year. So yes, it's a very small amount. It's a small proportion of what we do. The business development money? Yeah, the question is, what, what is the business development money? And it's a mix of things. We offer something called live feeds, which is basically access to the website in live form, real-time changes. Um, that brings in a fair amount of money of that amount. And we also do things like we sell t-shirts on Cafe Press. It's little bits of things like that. Um, and then we've brought in a series of larger donations. So we had an anonymous donation of $500,000 around Christmas, I think. Uh, Vinod and Niru Kozla gave us $500,000. I think that was in March. And we had a lovely little story about a guy named Alan Bauer. I don't know if I've talked about this story yet, really publicly, but Alan Bauer was a guy who I had said, remember back in the days before we had fundraising staff, Alan Bauer was a guy who donated $10,000 to the Wikimedia Foundation just because he liked the projects, right? He just liked what we did. That was a couple of years ago. When he donated that money, nobody sent him a letter, nobody phoned him up. We didn't have fundraising staff, so there was nobody really to reach out to him and to explicitly thank him for that donation. A year after that, he donated another $10,000. Again, right, so good for him, right, because he kept on giving, even when we ignored him, sort of. <laughs> so he gave us another $10,000, which was great. And then Sarah, who's here, who's been working with us for the last sort of six months, Sarah ha had said to me, you know, I, I found, I stumbled across this guy, Alan Bauer, who had given us $20,000. She said we should write him a letter and just thank him for that. And so we did. So we wrote him a fairly elaborate letter, which just said, you know, we're really sorry. We haven't thanked you in the past. We know that you've given twice to us, and it's a significant amount of money, and we're really grateful. But we're a young organization. We weren't terribly organized. We didn't actually consistently thank people. 
But now we're getting you know, ourselves a bit more organized. We're growing up a little bit. So we just wanted to say thanks. And he called the office the next week, and we had a little conversation. It was really nice. He's a really nice guy. He worked in insurance. He likes the projects. He's very in favor of education. And 10 days later, he sent us a check for $125,000. <laughs> <laughs> and on it, he said, happy birthday, Sue, because it was my birthday that week, which was very nice. <laughs> so that kind of thing, I mean, A, that suggests that it might not be a terrible idea to have professionals on staff who can say, oh, thank this person, please. Um, and also, it just speaks to the idea that there really is such an enormous amount of goodwill about these projects that people just want to help us, right? So it's really nice. The way I think about it is there are all many of the people in this room who build the projects and do the work and create the encyclopedia and the other stuff. And then there are people who maybe for whatever reason don't want to contribute their time or are not in a position to contribute their time. And they give us money, and that's great, too. It's all good, you know? Um, also, I think in March, uh, the Sloan Foundation gave us our first really large institutional grant, which was terrific. So they committed to give us a million dollars a year over three years, so three million dollars in total. We've gotten one million now and then again next year and the year after that. And that's what's known um, as institutional funding, which means that it's money that really isn't specifically tied to any particular program or any particular endeavor. It's really a gesture of good faith in our organization, of, of, of belief in us. And what they said to us was, you know, we like what you're doing, we think you're on a good path, we want to help you, and we're willing to just fund you institutionally. So take this money, we believe in you, do good things with it, and report back, and so we will. And I do want to take a moment to thank Eric for that, because it was Eric who built that relationship with the Sloan Foundation and had those conversations with those people that resulted in that. And it's been really terrific for us. Obviously, the money is great, but what's also great is just the idea that those people um, believe in us and they're sending a signal to other organizations that they can believe in us as well. So that was really nice. And then nobody knows this. This is the first time I'm saying this publicly. The Frank Stanton Foundation just finalized, we got their check last week for $262,000 for hardware. So that's, re yes. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really, really nice. It's really great. They're really great people. Um, they, Frank Stanton was a broadcasting executive. And uh, a foundation was created in his name. And the purpose of the foundation is to help disseminate information and make sure people have access to knowledge. And so it's obviously very lined up with what we do. They like us a lot. We like them. We're going to buy some servers. And then, of course, we have other conversations underway with other people. But the gist of this is just to say that you know we've had a good year financially. We're quite stable. We're in good shape. People like us. They want to help us. It's all very positive. Um, I'm going to talk for a minute about, how am I doing for time, Eric? Am I talking too slowly? <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the question, the question is, are we talking to the Bill Gates people? And indeed we are, yeah. We've had informal conversations, I think, over the years with the Bill Gates people. Um, I think most recently, I think Florence had some conversations with them fairly recently. Uh, what? Oh, I thought I heard something. Um, and, uh, and we are going to start talking with them a little more formally. Eric and I started talking to foundations um, in December, sort of, um, in a systematic way, like going out and meeting with people and presenting to them and just starting to let them know that we're here and, and that we're in the Bay Area now. But Gates is on our list. We have a friend there, and so we're going to start opening conversations with them. No, a lot of the foundations, I mean, our, our, our remit is broad enough that it's interesting to a lot of people, right? And we also believe that, um, that there are so many people, particularly in technology, who have made a lot of money. They were you know, smart and lucky, and they made lots and lots of money. And now a lot of them are interested in changing the world and making it a better place. You know? And if I were a philanthropist and I was looking around thinking, where will I put my money? I would want to put it somewhere that was already having a huge impact and had already proven itself that this is a success and it will change things. And so I, I think we're kind of a no-brainer if you're, if you're a philanthropist looking to change things. Um, Okay, I'm going to go a little bit more quickly. So 
just milestones in terms of programming. Um, Frank Schulenberg was hired recently, which was terrific. People know Frank from the German chapter, where he was the vice chair, and he was also the founder of the Wikipedia Academy, which is a public outreach program um, that we've been carrying for a couple of years, carrying out for a couple of years. We recently had Wikipedia Academies in South Africa, in France, and Germany. We have ones planned for Sweden and for Poland. There are probably others underway that I don't know about, we're doing as many of them as we can because we think that they're a great way to reach out to people. And Frank more recently has also been developing train the trainer workshops. So if you know how to teach people how to edit Wikipedia and you can teach other people to do the same thing, it can have a multiplier effect, which is really powerful. Um, and he's also creating some public outreach videos on the theory that you know face-to-face -face conversations are ideal, but you know video can be disseminated much more quickly, right? So you can reach more people. Um, we have a bunch of new chapters. I don't think that the staff of the foundation really takes credit for the creation of the chapters, much as I would like to, but we have a whole bunch of new chapters, and there was a very good chapters meeting in the Netherlands in May. And so I personally am looking forward to, to really good relationships going forward with our chapters, which are doing really an amazing job. And I think particularly in outreach, there's a really high ceiling there. There's lots there that can be done. Uh huh. That's a good question. So the question was, what is the legal status of the chapters and how do we keep them lined up with the Wikimedia Foundation? And the answer is, we don't keep them lined up with the Wikimedia Foundation. They're independent entities. And so in theory, they could do things very differently and they could have, in, in effect, different um, immediate short-term goals and that kind of thing, depending on the context that they operate in. In practice, we're all here for the same reason and we're all trying to do the same thing. I think the concept is that a decentralized set of groups, everybody can experiment, everybody can try and do different things. And as long as they're linked together enough that they're, con they're connected and talking and communicating with each other and sharing what works and what doesn't work, the idea is a thousand flowers blooming will yield a better result than a centralized top-down organization. Having said that, recently the Board of Trustees um, created two chapters selected seats on the board, which I think was in part an attempt to have the chapters more closely involved in the governance of the foundation itself, the theory being that obviously they're related organizations and they have shared self-interest and they have common goals, so to bring them together a little bit is not a bad thing. Okay. Um, and then some technical milestones. So flagged revs, stable versions has been deployed on the Wikipedia, the German Wikipedia, which was a long time coming, um, and it's now available to be deployed on other Wikipedias. And Eric may talk a little bit more about this, I think. Single user login, which is just a simple, in my opinion, a simple usability initiative. Simple from a user standpoint, not a technical standpoint. <laughs> sorry, um, but long awaited and long wanted has been deployed, which is also very good news. Um, and we're, we're developing some PDF and ODT support is in internal testing right now, and we've done a bunch of other um, smaller functionality and backend things. We have some ambitious goals uh, to, to really ramp up the usability of the MediaWiki software. The reason we wanna do that is because um, it is easy for the people in this room to use, but it is not easy for like my mom to use. And we wanna remove barriers to participation so that people like my mother can edit Wikipedia. Um, I'm gonna skip this. You can see these slides later. I'm gonna skip a couple. That's the org chart. You can see that later on the Wikimania website. Um, and maybe Eric, maybe I'll get you to go through the goals because I feel like I'm chewing up a lot of time in which you could be talking. <laughs> so at least you can do this part. So these are the, the goals that are the result of one of the first processes that we've ever had to actually develop goals for the organization in a systematic fashion. And they are sort of overarching goals which define what we want to accomplish in the next, in the current fiscal year, which is uh, July to June 30, 2009. And the first two ones may seem boring, but are critical in some ways and to improve our planning, to improve our metrics, our statistics, our data capture, um, it also includes, in, in terms of organization maturity, just reliability, data backups, making sure that the site is uh, responsive and uh, remains available. And in terms of financial sustainability, Sue's already talked about the uh, various sources of uh, revenue ranging from business development to 
uh, online fundraiser to foundations and uh, individual donors uh, on the small level, on the large level. So pulling in financial support from a variety of sources should make us sustainable in the sense that if any one of them drops down a little bit, we can compensate through the others. But below that, the three other goals you see here are the actual programmatic goals of the foundation that drive our mission and our values beyond providing what we continue to provide, which is Wikipedia and its sister projects as a self-organizing community of volunteers. And so what you see here is um, encourage broaden participation. Um, our view is that the way to make the projects better, the way to make them more successful, and the way to make them scale is to bring more people in. That's always been the, the way that Wikipedia has scaled in the past, so we're trying to get underrepresented groups to participate. Frank Schulenburg, who's over there, is our head of public uh, outreach, and uh, he's the inventor of events like the Wikipedia Academies, which are workshops where people come together and learn how to edit Wikipedia, and academics are encouraged to contribute, students are encouraged to contribute. It's just a way to reach out to people who aren't currently editing and to uh, get them to participate. And so there's more of that in the making, and we're trying to figure out a way to scale the notion of uh, Wikipedia Academies and other outreach events, for example, by training the trainers, the people who actually uh, do the workshops, uh, and um, instead of organizing the workshops ourselves, or by partnering with a large organizations that could handle just like a bunch of those for us. And um, then the, the other big goal, obviously, for, uh, for us has always been quality. I mean, many of you may know that Wikipedia originated from a, another project called Newpedia, which was much more conservative and much more traditional than Wikipedia in its approach and tried to be a very established and peer-reviewed encyclopedia. And it failed uh, dramatically because the process was so complex that people wouldn't contribute. Wikipedia has taken the approach as the uh, successor of Newpedia having a radically open contribution environment and basically having collaborative peer review in the process of creating the encyclopedia. Modeling the system and improving upon it uh, could help us to uh, be uh, become a more reliable source of knowledge so that people always know when they go to a Wikipedia article, okay, so many people have looked at this article and they have found these issues or this article has been found to be of high quality and could be used in an educational setting. So just making it very clear to the reader what they're gonna get when they read Wikipedia is one of the goals of uh, the, the foundation. And one of the key projects for that is the flight revisions extension. Philip Birkin, who has been one of the key drivers of this project, is going to give a talk about that tomorrow. So if you're interested, I very much encourage you to, to go to that. And uh, he will talk about the experience with that uh, technology in the German Wikipedia. And then the fifth uh, goal, which is um, pretty important to us, is um, the, the distribution goal, which is getting the stuff out there to people who do not have internet access uh, or who have some form of internet access that we currently do not service very, very well, like cell phone access. So just distributing content beyond the uh, basic website that we're running right now. These are some challenges. and. Uh, I'd like to encourage you when you fill out the survey to think a little bit about these issues. So how do we scale up volunteer participation in all of these initiatives? Because we are a very, very small organization still, but the volunteer community is gigantic. It's multilingual, it's international. Many, many of uh, members of the community are here. How do we scale participation in all the initiatives of the foundation beyond just editing the projects? How we get, do we get people who could stage events and who could lead workshops matched up with the right organizations and so forth? We've been talking to organizations like volunteermatch.org which have experience in matching volunteers to nonprofits and figuring out what approaches they use in organizing and matching volunteer contributions. And so we're looking into ways that we could build our own volunteer database, for example, allowing volunteers to reg register themselves on, on Wikipedia and saying these are my skills and these are the areas in which I would like to help and then connecting them to opportunities in the Wikimedia projects that make sense to them. And uh, with regard to quality, the, and the issue that always comes up in those conversations is if, for example, you uh, go to Wikipedia and you will always see the most recent reviewed version as opposed to the most recent version and every edit that is made has to pass through some kind of review process or at least edits by some users have to, then does that kill the wiki model? Does that mean that people are no longer contributing because they feel that their edits have to be approved by some 
super group of users they are not part of, does that mean that we can scale more poorly because contribution is not as, as immediately gratifying? So those are questions that, that we need to answer. So I'm going to uh, walk through some uh, pictures before we wrap up. This is a photo of uh, the Wikipedia Academy uh, that was organized uh, in Johannesburg in South Africa last year, and you just see the general set of is people sitting in front of computers and being taught how to edit Wikipedia. That's the most simple model of doing that. And in this case, encouraging contribution, particularly in, uh, for example, the uh, languages of South Africa. We would like to host more of these events, and possibly uh, following Wikimania even in Egypt and other Arabic countries. And we would like to see uh, that model really scale up to its maximum potential. A little bit about uh, cell phones. I mean, when I walk through Cairo or through uh, other uh, cities in Egypt, you will see almost as many uh, cell phone stores as grocery stores. It's really amazing uh, what level of penetration cell phone technology already has reached here. At the same time, cell phones obviously have challenges, particularly cell phones that only have um, SMS capability, no GPRS, and so forth. What can you do with them? Can you use them to access Wikipedia? Uh, can you use them to contribute? What you see here are screenshots on the left of, uh, and on the right of the iPhone user interfaces that there are for Wikipedia. And in the center, you see our own uh, cell phone user interface that you can use um, to access Wikipedia on a cell phone that has uh, WAP support. But there's obviously a lot more uh, that we can do. Some interesting ideas have been explored in recent years. For example, an initiative called Mobile Ad, where users could send SMS messages to a server, uh, to a phone number, and then they would get a free call back, and they would get the article read to them using text-to-speech synthesis of the article. So you wouldn't need any actual internet access. It would just all happen through the phone line, and you could use the keyboard on your phone to navigate. So these kinds of things might be interesting to uh, use whatever technology is available to transfer knowledge to people. This is a screenshot of the uh, stable version technology, and it just gives you the basic idea. It adds the uh, icon in the top right corner, which indicates that a version of an article that you're looking at in Wikipedia has been looked at by an, an, another editor of the site, and it gives uh, reviewers the ability to add, add, with the controls at the bottom, their own comments and their own reviews. And so this makes it possible to create a more reliable encyclopedia, or at least we, we hope it does. If you want to try it uh, yourself, you can go to de.wikipedia.org right now because that's where it is currently being tested. And it's been, uh, um, basically we've given the go for any wiki community in the Wikimedia universe to ask us to enable this. Uh, so as people want to, they will start experimenting with this and see um, what kind of difference they can make with this technology. Um, this is a little bit uh, of an interesting research project by a, a university in California that evaluates actually the edits that people are ma uh, making in Wikipedia and assigns uh, colors to the text based on whether they are trusted long-term editors or whether they're completely new editors. And in this case, it highlights a questionable portion of the text um, based on the fact that it was edited by a completely new, untrusted editor. And um, when people make uh, subsequent edits, then the uh, text becomes uh, differently colored. So as more trusted editors participate, the passage is still uh, under review as colored as being, needs to be checked, but uh, it's now been, been edited by a trusted user. So techniques like this could help editors to find questionable portions in text that need revision and that need editing. Uh, offline readers uh, are a critical component of our dissemination strategy. There's a project that's very interesting at this Wikimania conference called Moulin, and that's an offline reader software that's open source. It's one of uh, several such solutions that are currently under development. This is a different one called Kivix, and these applications can be used to build offline versions of Wikipedia on DVD, on USB sticks, or in other formats. We also offer a static HTML version of Wikipedia that people can download on static.wikipedia.org and uh, just run it on their laptop when they have no internet connection. That's something you don't even need any uh, kind of special software for, just a lot of disk space. Um, wiki to print technology is something we've been uh, trialing uh, now for a while, and it basically gives you the ability to uh, add a bunch of articles from Wikipedia into what we call a collection, where you can then rearrange them and print them in the form of a PDF or get a print-on-demand uh, copy 
through a print-on-demand service that gets sent to you by a regular mail. So we're actually still utilizing print when it makes sense. We're not making any presumptions about which of these distribution technologies make sense. We want to support them, and we want to give people the ability to experiment with them in their local settings and use the ones that matter to them the most. So we want to support cell phones. We want to support offline readers. We want to support PDF generation. Um, word processor file generation and so on so that people can get the stuff out there in as many different forms as, as possible and can experiment with it and disseminate it because that's the point of free knowledge is to enable free dissemination and sharing. Um, there's another very cool project called Kaltura and they're a sponsor of this conference as well and they're developing uh, a flash applet that can be used to actually edit video files collaboratively so multiple people can work on a video using the sequence editor and pull different sequences together, cut sequences, and basically create a video together with, which has, like a wiki page, its own uh, revision history. So it's a very, very potentially powerful tool. Now there's a challenge with that in that it's implemented in Flash, and we have a little bit of an aversion against Flash because it's not completely open source technology. And so Kaltura um, is actually sponsoring for us a, a software developer now, and this is the first time that this has been publicly said. Uh, his name is Michael Dale, and he's been working on the MetaVid project, which is a completely open source collaborative video editing and uh, searching solution. And Michael will also present at this conference. And Kaltura will sponsor Michael's work on a fully open source video sequencing editing solution for Wikipedia that can be used as an alternative to this Flash based environment so that we're not dependent on Flash and that we can give people the option to edit video collaboratively using a completely open source software stack. Thank you. So just to wrap up the tech piece, um, there's a few frontiers that we're looking at. Uh, the usability piece is huge, and we want to make it small. We want to chunk it up so that we can actually manageably implement changes to the system that make the software more friendly for people. Because it's too easy to just sink a lot of money into a three-year project and then at the end come out with empty hands. So we're trying to figure out what are the incremental changes that we can make to make the uploading of images, the editing of text, the editing of data easier for people? And we're trying to find funding for that as a part of a longer program initiative that we could take. And uh, in addition, we should explore uh, what it would take to make Wikipedia use, for example, a rich text editing interface. But don't underestimate that because Wikipedia is, in essence, a content programming environment. It's not just a content editing environment. You can lit literally write code in Wikipedia, like a, a computer application. And so the stuff that you find in Wikipedia can be quite complex, and expressing all the same functionality through a completely user-friendly interface is not easy. So that's the reason why we don't have it yet. So we're exploring the ways we could get there eventually, but there's probably not any incremental way to get, get from our current user interface to a completely rich text user interface. So there might be a project in parallel that we need to develop to just have a, a point at which we might decide, OK, that interface is now mature enough that we can switch over. And um, then there is uh, things like uh, the uh, furtherance of quality assurance technologies. What, in addition to uh, the stable version technology that I mentioned and the heuristics could we use, uh, for example, vandalism patrolling or edit patrolling tools that make people's lives easier? Uh, how do we handle data that uh, occurs in Wikipedia articles, whether it's populations of countries or any other kinds of numbers and uh, statistics that we could pull, um, pull out and that we could give people in searchable form? There's a presentation that you will find in your program about an application called uh, Semantic Media Wiki, and if you're interested in that part, go to it. It's amazing, and they've done fantastic work in the last few years on developing a completely new kind of wiki technology for dealing with structured data. So I'm, I'm sure that's going to be a very, very interesting talk for those of you who care about this. Uh, in addition to offline readers, it would be interesting to figure out if there are ways to allow people to contribute with limited connectivity. It's an even harder problem, but it's not impossible. In fact, in the software development community, it's very commonplace that people contribute source code to a project without connectivity and synchronize the changes when they got online. That's how Linux got developed in the early days when people didn't have permanent internet connections. Can we have something similar for Wikipedia where people can make changes to an article offline and then synchronize them to Wikipedia? Maybe. And then there's things like integrating wikis with each other, having wiki news articles show up automatically in Wikipedia, or even connecting Wikimedia Foundation wikis with external wikis more intelligently and showing relevant information, relevant uh, cross-context sensitive uh, links where appropriate. 
but also in enabling multilingual collaboration more easily so that communities from different cultures and different backgrounds can interact more easily. And on the horizon, really, a, a few years from now would be things like editing the same document in real time with multiple people. Google Docs actually allows you to do that today if in a somewhat a haphazard manner. You can go to Google Docs, create a document, share it with five people, and edit the same document with five people at the same time. And you see their changes as they make them, and they see yours as you make them. That's pretty cool, and we don't have anything like that. And it's hard to do well, but it's an interesting possibility. And there's things like discussion systems or even voice over IP integration. You could go crazy. So I'm sure there's going to be lots of really interesting stuff on the horizon for us. I want to let Sue talk about the big, hairy, audacious goal. <laughs> That's not a term we made up with, <laughs> made up. So I'm, I'm quite happy that we didn't. But it's a, a corporate term that's very standard for this sort of very large, overarching vision. Okay. Thanks, Eric. So we need to wrap up here. So this is the final slide, and then I've got one quick little comment, and then we won't be able to take any questions because we need to get out of here. But. Um, yeah, so BHAG is corporate business world jargon. It's ugly. No one <coughs> likes it, but it's a useful sort of thing, which is to create a goal that's 20, 30 years down the road that is not attainable. It's intended to be super, super audacious. It's a stretch goal. So our provisional BHAG, which we're going to have some kind of consultation process probably, and we're going to have some kind of refinement and revision process, but you want to have one thing that you can kind of get behind and think, yeah, that's where we're going. This is what we have so far. So the goal is to increase our educational reach to one-third of the planet's population by 2020, which is a significant increase from where we are today, and to motivate every 10th reader to become an active participant in the projects. We think that that hits the two, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> we think it hits the two high points, right? Because the one is reach. There's no point in doing amazing work if no one uses it. Now, we're already well past the point of no one using it. Lots of people use it. But obviously, the more people who use it, the more people we're reaching with the stuff, the better off everybody is. But also important for us, and we don't want to leave this behind ever, is the idea of participation. We don't want to have a small group of people create a bunch of stuff for a large group of people. We really ideally want lots of people creating lots of stuff for lots of other people. You know, So the more wide the participation is, the more diverse and broad the range of the contributors, the better and richer and smarter and fuller and more accurate the stuff is going to be. So it's important to us not just to reach people, but also to encourage them to participate. Over the next couple of months, I'm probably going to develop, we are probably going to develop some kind of report card that will measure reach, participation, some kind of measurements for quality. Um, and uh, we'll probably invite, through the internal community, if, if not broader, we'll invite people's participation into that. Um, the other quick little thing that I wanted to say, please fill out your surveys, give them to Frank, give them to Carrie. Also, though, over the last couple of days with the advisory board, the board of trustees and the advisory board and I met and went through some of this goal stuff and did some work around it, furthering and developing our thinking. That work, a report from that work, is going to go up on one of the public wikis. I don't know which one, probably Meta. And when it does go up, we want to invite the people here and then the broader community that isn't here to comment on it, to further develop it, to elaborate and refine and move it forward. The idea behind that is that the advisory board and the board of trustees were not just working so that they could help guide the work of the staff. You know, the thinking is intended to help everybody. So the more we can collaborate together, refine our thinking and move it forward, the more that individual people in this room or individual chapters or whomever can take that thinking and push it further and move forward with projects and work themselves. So we want to share in that. We want that to be a very mutual, very joint process. I don't know where it will be on Meta, and unfortunately Meta can be a little bit of a jungle. <laughs> But I'll try and find a way to get it out there in a way that you know points you towards it so you can actually help participate in that. So thank you so much. And I'm sorry we ran a bit late. We must now all go to the board panel, which is in the Great Hall. Please give the surveys to Carrie or Frank. You don't have to do it right now. You can find any of us later and give them to us if you're not finished. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have time for discussion, so we have to go directly to the board panel discussion in the Great Hall. Uh, we have cancelled the break uh, again. Uh, so, um, see you tomorrow. Bye.